In the uh, preceding presentation, I was discussing what I take to be the core idea behind the economics of social credit, the unifying thread in terms of which all of the other aspects can be arranged. When it comes to Douglas's political ideas, I think a similar approach may prove to be equally helpful. If there's a key word for understanding the political theory of social credit, I think that word would be sanctions. To sanction means to impose a penalty. And within the context of a political association, those individuals and groups who are in a position to impose penalties, sufficiently weighty penalties, are also in a position to determine which policies, which objectives will be pursued by governments and which will not be pursued. Sanctions are the means that allow people to exercise control over public policy. Now the fundamental problem with Western style democracy is that most of the sanctions, both official and unofficial, that exist in the political system are not in the hands of the right people. And those that are in the hands of the right people are very often ineffective for the task at hand. Now in making this type of assessment, I am presupposing that the political system exists for the sake of some definite purpose. So we can ask, what is that purpose? Well, if the purpose of economic association is to deliver the goods and services that people desire, as when and where desired, with the least amount of trouble to everyone, then the purpose of political association, according to Douglas, at least its immediate purpose, if not its ultimate purpose, is to ensure that the will of each and every individual will prevail over his own affairs. And to achieve this end to the extent that it is physically or objectively possible, and also with the least amount of difficulty, with the least amount of trouble to everybody. As Douglas put it in his book, Brief for the Prosecution, it is a legitimate corollary of the highest conception of the human individual that to the greatest extent possible, the will of individuals shall prevail over their own affairs. What does this mean? It means that coercive institutions, in other words, the mechanism of government, is only justified if it serves to maximize the sovereignty or freedom of each individual. Not in any absolute sense, not at the expense of others, but over the individual's own affairs. On this view, which I, I think is the correct view, everything that government does should aim at increasing the real concrete power of individuals of each and every person to manage and direct his own life. Public policies and activities which serve this end are good. Public policies and activities which take away or otherwise weaken the concrete power of all or some individuals to dispose over their own affairs are not good. As Douglas explained in The Tragedy of Human Effort, and I quote, the proper function of parliament is to force all activities of a public nature to be carried on so that the individuals who compose the public may derive the maximum benefit from them. This is what is meant by a free society. And by that I mean a free society in the Christian rather than the libertarian sense, a society that by recognizing and respecting natural law, what Douglas referred to as the canon, seeks to maximize the individual's scope for the exercise of responsible freedom. Now, if we accept this aim as the correct 
objective for governmental action, then effective sanctions to ensure that the objective is consistently pursued and achieved must be possessed by the individuals who compose society. That follows or should follow quite logically. Unfortunately, the societies in which we live do not adequately embody this Christian ideal of, of the free society. And as time goes on, we seem to be retreating further and further from it. The inevitable consequence of this retreat is economic, political, social, and cultural dysfunction. This is the price that we have to pay for not living in alignment with the objective nature of things, for not living in alignment with the natural law, with the canon. It's important to remember that while we are free to disobey the laws that govern the universe, some of them anyway, we're not free to avoid the natural consequences of having chosen to disobey those laws. At the present time, there is not a single Western democracy so-called which maximizes the sovereignty of the individual citizens. Most people lack, in some significant measure, the concrete power that is necessary in order to direct their own lives in keeping with natural law. We lack economic and political security. We lack, to a greater or lesser extent, the freedom to exercise resp responsible free speech and responsible action. We lack easy and independent access to the resources that we need to survive and flourish. We lack the leisure time, which, on a physical basis, modern economies could easily provide. In fact, whatever protestations to the contrary, Western democracies no longer even aim at establishing or preserving free societies. They are directed, at least in practice, if not also in principle, at a diametrically opposed objective, the centralization of power in fewer and fewer hands. This is seen perhaps most clearly in the progressive seeding of national sovereignty in order to form continental political blocks like the European Union. <coughs> so what we end up with is a situation in which democratic governments, so-called, thwart the general will of the people by not maximizing the sovereignty of the individual members of society. And to make matters worse, they quite often deliver results which are the exact opposite of what the people would really want. How many times do governments get away with imposing policies or programs that are opposed, even strongly opposed, by the majority of citizens? This is a rather curious state of affairs. How is it that democratic governments fail to fulfill the wishes of the people when, by definition, they are supposed to be government for the people, by the people, etc. Well, it goes back to the key factor that I had mentioned earlier, the effective political sanctions, the real political sanctions, that is to say, those that determine policy and that can make civil servants implement policy, are not held by the right people. The common citizen in conventional democracies do have sanctions, it is true, but these sanctions, which form a part of what we might call ballot box democracy, are, as we all well know, woefully ineffective. Ballot box democracy does not deliver effective control of the government within the due limits of natural law to the citizenry. From a social credit perspective, ballot box democracy fails because it is ill-designed. It does not allow each individual to say yes or no to one policy objective at a time. It does not allow the individual to opt out of policy decisions with which he disagrees. 
Instead, ballot box democracy puts forward just about every possible obstruction or stumbling block to ensure that the individual will not have effective control over his government. To begin with, the typical voting system only allows the citizens to have some sort of say once every couple of years. It does not provide a mechanism by means of which individuals could continuously exercise pressure on the government so that the results which they intend can be actualized. This means, in effect, that the government quite easily becomes a temporary dictatorship. How many times has a government in so-called democratic countries managed to impose policies which are opposed by the majority of the population because they were safely in between elections? Since nature abhors a vacuum, the absence of a suitable mechanism that would allow the citizens to sanction governments at any and all moments so naturally leaves these government officials subject to the more hidden forces which are in a position to exert continuous pressure through monetary or other means. A second problem with ballot box democracy is that it does not recognize its due limits. For example, it forces political minorities to acquiesce to the decision of the majority, or in many cases to the decision of the largest minority. Apart from certain provisions that may form part of a Bill of Rights or a Constitution that are intended to protect individual rights, there is no mechanism in place by means of which minorities can contract out of majority decisions. A closely related difficulty is that there is no reliable mechanism by means of which the majority can be prevented from supporting government decisions that violate the prescriptions of natural law. In other words, the objective principles which must be respected if a political system is to function properly. Thirdly, ballot box democracy assumes that it is right for the public as well as for their elected representatives to be concerned with purely technical methods with how a government should do something. This tends to take the focus off of the electorate and um, or rather it take, tends to take the focus of the electorate and of their representatives off of what the government should be doing. As a result, political discussion and debate often center on questions of administration as opposed to questions of fundamental policy. The different political parties are then given the task of proposing different technical methods by means of which policy can be realized. The problem with this is that the majority of the electorate, and indeed the majority of the party members themselves, are in no position whatsoever to offer a professional judgment as to the efficacy and overall appropriateness of the various technical methods. As Douglas explained it, and I'll, I'll quote again, it is not democracy of any conceivable kind to hold an election upon any subject requiring technical information and education. Fourthly, the inner logic of the political party system itself acts as a barrier to authentic democracy. For example, members of parliament who are supposed to be the representatives of the individuals and their constituencies have a very strong tendency under the influence of the party system to become slaves of their party and slaves to its leadership instead of duly functioning as the servants of the people who elected them. Achieving, maintaining, and consolidating power for the party require that the members of the party follow the instructions of the party, even when such obedience is at odds 
with the wishes of the electorate or with the prescriptions of natural law. This pressure, in combination with the focus on technical matters, often means that members of parliament end up acting as delegates, working on behalf of other interests rather than as simple representatives of the people. To complicate matters further, all too often the various parties simply offer different ways or methods of implementing the same policies. It is possible to allow talk of purely technical methods to so dominate the political discourse that questions of policy are completely <coughs> ignored. This can make it easier for a particular policy or set of policies to be subtly imposed. But as Douglas once objected, I, and I quote, it is not democracy of any conceivable kind to hold an election at regular or irregular intervals for the purpose of deciding by ballot whether you will be shot or boiled in oil. The overall effect of the party system is to divide the population into warring camps and no matter who wins the election, the people often find that the same basic policy, which is not put into question by anyone, will be adopted by the government of the day. For all of these reasons and a number of others that I have not mentioned, ballot box democracy does not constitute a real or an effective democracy. However, nature, as I've said, does not tolerate a vacuum. And if the common individual does not hold the effective political sanctions, then we can ask who does? From a social credit perspective, the overriding sanction in the existing social order is the power of money. Those individuals and groups who benefit the most from the existing monopoly of credit are the ones who are in a position to impose policies that are congenial to their own narrow interests at the expense of the common good. And I should add that this explanation for our present discontents does not require any elaborate conspiracy theory or any conspiracy theory at all. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't conspiracies, both large and small, but the point here is that an appeal to conspiracy is not even needed. The broad outlines of what is going on is really quite simple. In a society where money is in an artificially short supply and where the power to create it is the monopoly of the banking system, money becomes the center of an elaborate system of bribery, a system of rewards and punishments. People go along to get along. In the case of the political system, if the power of money is concentrated in your hands, a ballot box democracy can be a very useful instrument for imposing your own policies on a political association. Money, as a system of bribery, allows in some subtle and some not so subtle ways for the political environment to be manipulated in one's favor. Consider, for example, that all of the means of social communication, the press, the educational institutions, the entertainment media, are dependent, directly or indirectly, on finance for their continued operation. As a result, the conventional media cannot serve the politically independent role which an authentic democracy would require them to play. Political parties are likewise dependent on finance. It is difficult, if not impossible, to run a credible campaign if you don't have access to large sums of money. If you don't toe the line, if you don't serve the interests of the financial powers, you may find that you end up having less support from them and therefore less and less money with which to function. The most blatant manifestation of financial interference would be the case where a government is denied access to funds because 
It is pursuing a policy that is at odds with financial objectives. In his book, The Big Idea, Douglas recounts a very interesting anecdote in connection with this particular point, and, and I quote, some years ago, certain financial proposals I had made were put before a British cabinet minister of the inner ring by an influential intermediary. The reply received, of which I have an extract, was, whether Major Douglas's proposal is sound in theory, I do not know. It is a matter of little consequence. I can assure you that no British government would remain in office for three weeks if it attempted to put it into practice. Apart from theory, the concrete power of finance to thwart independently minded governmental action was perhaps most clearly demonstrated in the case of William Eberhardt's social credit government that had been elected in the 1930s in the province of Alberta and which held power under Eberhardt's leadership from 1935 to 1943. Every attempt on the part of that government to introduce some aspect of the social credit reforms, even those which did not obviously fall afoul of the British North America Act, was prevented by the Lieutenant Governor of the province and or by the federal government in Ottawa and or by the Privy Council and or by the Supreme Court of Canada and or by the Imperial Government in London. <coughs> The moneyed interests are also in a position to either neutralize the common individual through the provision of bread and circuses or to influence public opinion. If you control the means of communication, you can control access <clears throat> to information. And if you can control access to information, you can control how people perceive the world. If you control how people perceive the world, you can get them, some of them at any rate, to support policies that will serve your interests, even though such policies might actually be harmful to the common individuals who are blindly supporting them. It's just a question of marketing and brainwashing. Under the hegemony of the credit monopoly, it follows quite naturally that, as Douglas once said, the primary object of politics, industry, trade, advertising, and journalism is to sell delusion. So by pulling society from above and pushing it from below, the direction of policy in a typical Western democracy tends to stem not from the citizenry, but from the moneyed interests who dominate the society, whether we are talking about the banks or large transnational and multinational corporations, etc. Their general policy, as can be easily predicted, is to centralize power as much as possible, um, more and more power, whether economic, political, or cultural, in their own hands. Monopoly of power is the name of the game, and so I think that everything that happens in the political arena does not matter what the particular issue is, can be viewed in terms of how it serves that particular objective. So what is the solution? To speak in general terms, there needs to be a change in the overriding policy of political associations. In contrast to the monopoly of power, political power, that is to say the coercive power of the state, should only be used to decentralize sovereignty to the individual to the greatest possible extent, rather than to centralize it in the hands of an oligarchic elite. The first step towards that end would be to stop centralizing the power of money and to start decentralizing it so that a certain minimum proportion will be distributed to each individual. That, of course, is the objective of the economic reforms of social credit. Beyond that, more effective mechanisms and a more effective governmental structure 
need to be introduced so that individuals can start exercising real control over their governments. An effective democracy would be one which gave individuals the power to direct the activities of government within the limits of natural law. In order to achieve this, a social credit governmental system could be divided into three distinct parts serving three distinct purposes after the model of the Trinity. In the first place, there would have to be a governmental body, such as a Senate or upper house, that would be tasked with safeguarding the fundamental rights of the individual, those rights that come from God and are therefore prior to the state, such as the right to life. This chamber would have um, the obligation and, and the right and the obligation to reject any piece of legislation that violated such basic rights. When it comes to government activities, services and programs, it would be necessary to clearly separate the policy determining powers of government from the policy administrating powers of government. The second governmental body would therefore consist in a set of civil service hierarchies whose task would be to oversee and direct government operations and programs. This is the, the policy administrating power of government. In general, holders of bureaucratic power must be held directly and personally responsible for the use of that power, should be selected on the basis of merit alone, and should act as servants of the citizens. As Douglas has expressed the matter, and I quote, the business of bureaucracy is to get us what we want, not to annoy and hinder us by taking from us by taxation and irritating restrictions those facilities which we otherwise should have. The third governmental body would have to consist in the individual citizens themselves who, either directly or through their representatives, would have the power to determine the sort of policy that the civil servants are supposed to implement. In order to ensure that the citizens are in a position to enforce their preferences with regards to the type of results that they want from government, some new mechanisms or variations on old mechanisms would have to be introduced. Clearly, the standard right to vote in a ballot box democracy does not work. It's not effective. The important thing about the mechanisms in question is that they work well in practice, that they get the job done. So the suggestions that follow are not a matter of ideology, but of practicality. Some possible mechanisms include, for example, the right to recall representatives. Right? Recall would put some pressure on members of parliament when they are in between elections. And it could also be used to ensure that they only deal with policy objectives, not with technical matters. And that they represent the wishes of their electors accurately. If, in the judgment of a majority of his constituency, a certain representative is not functioning satisfactorily, recall would allow them to remove the representative from office, in other words, to fire him. Uh, we also have citizen initiatives and referenda on matters of policy. That would be a form of voting which would allow citizens to accept or reject one proposal at a time as a possible objective of government action. Another suggestion, uh, which comes straight from Douglas, is the replacement of the secret ballot with an open and recorded vote. Uh, in an effective democracy, it is fundamental that all political power, including that which is held by the common citizen, um, be united with responsibility and not separated from responsibility. Douglas went so far as to say, and I quote, the degradation of British politics 
can almost be identified with the introduction of the secret ballot. A man who is ashamed or afraid to let it be known how he votes is afraid to take responsibility for the consequence of his voting and has no right to, vo to a vote. The open ballot would have the advantage of helping immensely with the elimination of vote fraud or manipulation, as if it, you know, if it were implemented, every voter could check, let's say, if the vote were conducted electronically and the results published publicly on the internet, every voter could check to see that the vote that is recorded is the vote that he actually uh, made. Fourthly, the individual should be given the widest possible latitude to contract out of government programs um, <coughs> that uh, you know, he doesn't approve of, doesn't agree with. Um, the most formidable sanction which individuals and association can possess is the power to contract out or opt out of the group. Having the right to contract out effectively minimizes the coercive power of the state. It can thus prevent majorities from imposing themselves on minorities or minorities from imposing themselves on majorities. The right to contract out or opt out could take the form of what is called a voter's veto. Uh, this was described by Douglas as follows, and I quote, it is necessary to provide individuals as individuals, not collectively, with much more opportunity to judge political matters by results and to be able to reject individually and not collectively policies they do not like, which involves a large measure of power to contract out. The bottom line of all of these social credit political reforms is that a well-informed electorate must be empowered to effectively demand the specific results that they require by applying sufficient pressure on the government, either directly or through their representatives. This would entail the progressive replacement of what we know as party politics by restoring political initiative over matters of policy to the voters. That is, by extending the scope of direct democracy and by insisting on the purely representative function of indirect democracy. So that's the politics of social credit in a nutshell. There's much more that could and should be mentioned, but I'm sure that I've given you probably enough to, uh, to reflect on. We have been through Citizens initiate a, a referenda, voters veto, uh, and uh, the right to recall. And it, we haven't been very successful, and I've given this some consideration. And our tactics in the past, I don't think have been correct. Mm -hmm. Mainly because, in the first instance, we must have the support of the sitting politicians to implement any one of those three things. Mm -hmm. To submit them as a block, no politician is going to be very keen after debating something and then having it passed into law and then having it vetoed by the people. Secondly, the, uh, the right to recall, it's really a chance to bring the politician before the people to make him accountable to something that his term of office. And he's not going to be very keen on that. So if you put these all up in a block, you're not going to get very far because you must have their support. But let's take them one at a time. Let's go for citizens initiated referenda. And let's go for it at local government level. Some councils have brought it in. Now, if you can get citizens initiated referenda in, I'm quite sure the people would like it. 
have a say, and if anyone is opposed to it, you just turn round to them and say, are you against people having a say in their own affairs? Pretty hard to refute. <laughs> Once you get that in, then you take the next step. Citizens initiated referenda with the right to recall or the right to veto, but not the whole three as a package. Mm. I shouldn't mind answering Lou's question, is this the right policy? And the only answer is that depends on whether it works. Um, we're talking mechanisms here. We're not talking about how to put the bell on the cat, but we're talking about what we need if we're going to have a social credit society. We know it's difficult to do, um, but cultures can change and needs can arise and the ability to touch people through the internet and elsewhere is working towards us. Another mechanism that I think is going to be most important is the voucher system in education, where parents are empowered to take the funding for education to the school of their choice. One of the things that's not been enunciated here today, but for those who are interested in some of the early church fathers, um, certainly it goes back to St Thomas Aquinas, is <coughs> the principle of sub subsidiarity, which means that a level of organisation within society, if, it's, if for instance it's the family is capable of exercising or doing something, it ought not to be done by a higher power. If local government is able to put, put the pothole, fix the pothole, that should not be a federal government matter. And that is part of what we're trying to do. So I'm just asking, making the point that maybe um, the voucher system of education where every all the parents if it costs whatever it costs seven thousand dollars per child or per term or whatever it is on average and that's what the government's spending on education mm. they don't send it directly to the schools they send a voucher to the parents those parents take that to the school of their choice the, the schools of which they approve grow those of which they disapprove atrophy and that empowers individuals to get well, the chosen credit objective of efficiency in terms of human satisfaction. So I think. There may be some merit in trying to push that through first, because if people see that, they, that it's possible for the government to uh, facilitate their independent desires in one area, that of education, they may gain confidence and seek to have other powers given to them that would also uh, give them some more control over their own affairs. So uh, that might be, strategically, that might be, be worth pursuing as a first step. And um, certainly there are probably many variations on that theme that, that could be devised as a way of decentralizing political power to the people who are directly affected. One of the reasons um, the current government whatever flavour it is, is so successful is that over a period of, of decades, many decades, they've inculcated a feeling of helplessness in, the, in, in, in families and individual voters. They feel that, as, uh, and that um, idea that uh, Chaz brought to light then about, um, um, that's very much a sanction if you have a, a credit right. note that you right. can take somewhere other and see a, a, an immediate benefit for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for that Oliver. You've just, you've touched on, the, there's been a couple of speakers, uh, questions touched on a couple of things and it's about the um, the authority coming back to the individual. All right, now Chaz touched on it with uh, education and parenting mm -hmm. and um, Lou touched it on in regard to local government which I think is actually, I think you mentioned it, uh, it's a branch of the state government so it would be difficult to get CIR through local government while it's actually controlled and totally controlled by the state government. So this comes back to the, to me, the, the sanction that we're looking for within a community, mm. that political will 
I've seen it with Egypt, I've seen it with the Ukraine recently. The Middle East is a basket case of people trying to actually have some say in what's going on. And every turn, it's undone, it's undone, it's undone. And uh, to me, the, to me it, it comes back to, I think Douglas touched on these things coming from the grassroots of, of how it is. In it, it, Aberhart and, and Alberta had that education program going where people were fed these first principles. They were fed the information that actually turned the light on and then said, hang on, the power rests within. It is, it is here. It is not outside of you. It is not with government or the fascist bureaucrats or whoever. It's within. Could you just work that through with us, please? From a social credit point of view, it's important to recognize that uh, social power, political power, comes from the individual. It's not something that comes from, from the outside. And so if you believe that, then naturally it makes perfect sense to arrange your social operating systems, uh, the financial system, the economic system, political system, in such a way that it allows the individual to exercise power and to, to increase his access to resources so he can direct his own life. Um, the, the sort of society in which we're living at present believes that power comes from the outside and that it's legitimate, you know, governments exist for the purpose of, of uh, exercising power over individuals rather than serving individuals. So I think that's, that's kind of the key factor here. Do we exist to serve the government or does the government exist to serve us? Yeah. And if the government exists to serve us, yes, then we yeah. have to have some kind of mechanism in place by means of which we can force the government to do that. And if it's, it's not doing it or not doing it well, they can be sanctioned. Right? It's just going through my mind. I'd just uh, like you to expand on it. But uh, on one question, uh, you've got the ability to opt out. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And, um, you know, we have... Uh, uh, a necessity to vote in Australia, mm -hmm. um, so we can't opt out. But in other countries, they do, and, they don't, and maybe that's yeah. good for them. But also, there's a lot of... I mean, we're talking about sanctions on governments. Um, there's a lot of apathy, I mm -hmm. suppose, in people, just generally. When everything's going well, um, who cares? You know, it's going well. I don't need to worry about it. So how do you... I mean, obviously, the momentum can build up in some way. Mm -hmm. And people uh, get excited about uh, using their rights and um, individuals, but yeah, I'm just sort of wondering how you could address that. Please. In some ways, I think this is the key problem. Um, I'm not a psychologist, but I guess it boils down to one or two things. Either you know, it's either the character or the stick. And Douglas, of course, was of the point of view that um, inducement is more powerful ultimately than compulsion. So you've got to find some way, some concrete way preferably, that uh, you can get people to take an interest because they see it directly, immediately benefits them. In some ways, I suppose we have our hands tied uh, because of the way in which the, the governmental system is structured, but there are local initiatives um, that can be uh, adopted and, and pursued. And I think if, if we start with that and we build on that, you'll see an organic development. One thing can lead to another. And, um, and hopefully that would be some way of, of generating some kind of interest. Clearly, the powers that be are not going to deliver the means of mass communication so that we can inform people about social credit, right? So um, we, have to, uh, we have to find some other way. The internet, of course, I think is um, a potential game changer because uh, anyone can have access to it from, you know, as long as they have got a, a computer and an, an internet connection. And um, if we can, and I've said this before, but I think that there are millions upon millions of people in this world who would be social creditors if they only knew about it and, and understood it. So I, I think that it, the truth has its own dynamic and, and it, it draws people and it, it uh, motivates people. So if you can get people to take an interest for themselves, by themselves, you know, just open their minds, I think with a certain number of people anyway, um, they will do the rest if you can just sort of get them to take that initial step.